Hey everyone, welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast. I am your host, Dave Durante, with our normal co-host, Chad Vaughn, but we also have our guest this week, Mr. Chris Hinshaw, coming in from abroad. He is out in Germany this week, and we were lucky enough to get him on for our third announcement week of the Open, this being 22.3, but we also have a fourth guest, another guest host this week, a special guest. Because there were double unders in this workout, we brought in the man himself, Mr. Dave Newman, the uh, owner and founder of RX Smart Gear, to talk about some double uh, double under action. Before we get into the podcast itself, we want to mention our incredible sponsors. This week we have two. Uh, this week is sponsored by Victory Grips and RX Smart Gear. These guys are leading the charge when it comes to product development and community involvement. Uh, they've been a huge part of Power Monkey Camp for a number of years. In fact, I tell a lot of people that Dave Newman is one of the reasons why Power Monkey Camp is what it is. Without him, we wouldn't have been able to do Power Monkey Camp 1, and he's continued to, to be a big part of what we do now coming into our 17th camp in two months. Victor, the owner and founder of Victory Grips, is always with us at camp, provides us with some of the best there is when it comes to grips and other pieces of equipment. They are both incredible inventors and great people within the community. If you're looking for more information, please head, head over to victorygrips.com. They have a ton of great information on the best grips in the business and all different types, depending on what kind of bar, what kind of rings you're using, also kind of type you might want to be using for the type of hand that you have. Also, you can head over to RX Smart Gear uh, for a special promotion that they're running. For all listeners, there's 15% off on your next purchase by using the code PMC15. That's PMC, all caps, 15 for 15% off your next RX Smart Gear order. And now let's get to the podcast. The last of the open workouts, 22.3. Just announced a long workout in terms of how it's written up, but depending who you are, it could be done in well under, uh, you know, seven minutes here. Workout itself, 21 pull-ups, 42 double-unders, 21 thrusters. Uh, the weights start to increase over the course of the workout, starting at 65.95, then to 75.115, then finally ending at 85.135. Uh, last movement, or excuse me, then this middle section is bumping up to chest to bar, 18 reps, 36 double unders, 18 thrusters, then 15 bar muscle ups, 30 double unders and 15 thrusters. So for those of you listening out there, we do have special guest with us today, the man himself, Mr. David Newman, the inventor, the man behind everything RX Smart Gear related. We thought that if there was a double under workout, then there's nowhere, no one better to have than Dave himself. Thanks for coming on with us today, Dave. Thanks for having me, fellas. Great to hang out with you. So what did you guys think about the workout? Uh, overall, general impressions. Start with you, Dave. What'd you think? Uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, it's, it's going to suck. Those are heavy thrusters. And uh, unless you're pretty efficient at those gymnastics movements, um, that's going to be a limiter too. We saw those athletes, you know, breaking up, dropping off the bar. Lauren Fisher was dropping uh, on her bar muscle ups. Uh, I think chest bars maybe too. So, you know, when you see those elite athletes breaking things up, that's definitely a cue for the rest of us, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's such a deceiving mm -hmm. thing to watch an open announcement and then try to take anything from those athletes and try to apply it to yourself. It's just like, this doesn't work. You need to compare yourself to someone else. I think I, I've, I've seen that meme kind of a while ago. Whenever the Olympics is going on, you need to have a normal everyday person from their couch performing in the same event just so you can have uh, mm -hmm. the ability to understand what the difference is between an elite athlete versus yourself. We need the same thing. And I don't think we got it with the athletes from Hendersonville that were competing because they were awesome. They kicked yep. ass. Both the guys and the ladies were incredible. So I don't think we got really a true look at what the average CrossFitter is going to uh, be having in terms of fatigue uh, points here. But um, it's always a little deceiving. It's great to watch someone complete it in five minutes and 27 seconds. But I think it's a little deceiving to think that all of us are going to be able to pull something from that and apply it to our own workout. Mm -hmm. Chad, what did you think? Uh, fear. I mean, when, when I saw it, immediately seeing the <laughs> the uh, pull-ups and and knowing that they were going to turn into chest to bar and then um, uh, bar muscle ups and and seeing that it's very Fran like, it always reminds me of the first time I did Fran. And I think probably any CrossFitter remembers the first time you did Fran, if, if not the exact day or time, like I remember the pull-up bar. I remember the feeling. I remember the difficulty in it. And of all these years of doing CrossFit, it's not gotten any easier, right? And, and typically CrossFit doesn't because you just keep getting, you know, maybe better scores, but the feeling and the difficulty doesn't get any easier. And 
we were mentioning before we press record the break that double unders may be. And for some people, they may be, a, may be a little bit of a break. If you're efficient with double unders, if you can do them well, then, you know, maybe they are. And for me, I'm glad that double unders are in there because they are at least a slight of a bit of a break to break up those pull-ups and, uh, and those thrusters. But it's, a, it's definitely a brutal workout. I mean, it's definitely going to be the most brutal, most brutal workout of the three, I would say. So I'm always a huge fan. Oh, uh, we have uh, our, our third normal uh, guest host jumping in right now. We'll pick back up, but we do have Mr. Hinshaw coming in from the other side of the world right now. Let's so get him in here. Let's get Chris in and uh, see what he's been up hey, to. Chris. Boy, what an Chris, entrance. muted. There, there we, we go. go. What's up, my man? How are you, Chris? Good. Hold on. I got a lot going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Just uh, give people a quick update on where you're coming in from, Chris. Uh, I'm just outside of Nuremberg at uh, Adidas HQ. Uh, I spent the, the whole day with them, their product team, and... Um, Talking about health and fitness, the things that we love so much. I love it. Love it. So we had three open workouts, and Chris has been in three different locations. Mm -hmm. He's an international man of mystery, traveling around the world, uh, spreading uh, open workouts and fitness everywhere he goes. You know, one of the things that's really interesting, um, and I've been here several times over the last six years, and and you see their interest in fitness and and it would be amazing if, if Adidas came into this sport, um, you know, to think of the brands Adidas has been missing and, and, you know, they're the most dominant sporting brand here in Europe. And mm -hmm. I think it would, would offer some value. And, and one of the things that they're actually looking at is, you know, one of their pillars of business is fitness, the sport of fitness and recognizing that it's, it's one of the largest, um, sport uh, groups in the world. And um, yeah, it. that's kind of cool. Yeah, kind of cool. It. Yep. Well, did, did you have a chance to look at the workout? We've been uh, <laughs> just slowly starting our conversation around it. What'd you think overall global first impression? Well, I find it really interesting that last week, what we said was, is, is, you know, it's going to be maybe chest bar double under. Um, the only thing that they can make that workout worse is what they did. To throw in double unders is ridiculous. I, 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 I. Hey, thrusters? I'm not going to do it, just so you know. There's no <laughs> way I'm doing this workout. Oh, you got to do you one rep, to. at least one rep. <laughs> Does it start with thrusters? No. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm telling you that, that, this workout is terrifying. I, yeah. I don't know how you guys feel, but I mean, Dave Newman, you probably love it. It's, you know. Well, no, numbers. I I know I'm not I'm not going to get through the whole thing, so I won't have to do all the reps. <laughs> well, we we were just about to say, um, you know, our our own little kind of takes on it, where we think sticking points might be. Um, but I want to jump to you, Dave, being that this is the first workout that we've had with double unders. But to me, it's a little anticlimactic because you know, Chad, you were saying that you know, if you're not good at double unders, obviously it'll be a sticking point for you, but. With the structure of the workout, the number of reps with double unders, it seems almost like an afterthought. Um, I, I'm, it's not really a true test for double unders uh, unless you can't do double unders. So I don't really see it as a big separator for anyone who's at least adequate at them. What, what are your thoughts with double unders? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. It's, it's kind of it's kind of pointless. It's really a throwaway move for that workout. If you're somebody who has double unders, um, you know, it's a, a total of 108 double unders. You know, if you do those unbroken, that's 60 seconds, 65 seconds worth of, of uh, effort, honestly, you know, and that's, so that's all you get for a rest, you know, before you have to pick up the barbell is, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. It, it was kind of very anticlimactic, but yay, we get double under. So, uh, you know, <laughs> well, so, so Dave, in, in a workout like this, let me ask you if, if you were going to suggest a certain number of double unders per round, what do you think would be a good, a better test? for double under specifically and for the workout as a whole? Uh, you mean if we were going to, if we were going to modify that workout? Yeah. If, if you were more if, challenging. Yeah. Yeah. With just with double under specifically. 
Yeah, I mean, at least um, at least double up what they put in the workout, right? Chris, you'd probably agree with that. I would double up the quantity of workouts, you know, just to ramp up that duration or make them heavy double unders. You know, I'm a big mm. fan of heavy and add more intensity because then, then the people who have poor technique and blow up their shoulders, they're going to feel it on the thrusters for sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, using your speed rope and doing such low reps like that, it, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a joke, but uh, whatever. Maybe, maybe, again, the people, like Dave said, the people who don't have double unders, right. that's going to be a limiter if there's a lot of trips, right? Every time you trip, you're mm -hmm. looking, you know, if, if you start right back up, you're looking at minimum two and a half to three seconds of time you're right. wasting every time you trip and reset. So, um, you know, that's, that's the thing. Those people uh, at the more beginner level are going to have to really try and be systematic and just chip away and get through those things um, just so they could go enjoy those, those heavy thrusters. <laughs> I yeah, don't know if enjoy like, is the right word. <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. not thruster wise, but it seemed like the workout was written in a way to expose people, right? Are, are you deficient in gymnastics? Are you deficient in your lifting? Are you deficient in double unders? It's, it's trying to figure out where mm -hmm. a particular weakness is. And, you know, for me, I look at the thruster and I say, well, I know I'm not going to be able to do, you know, 18 or 15, 135 pound thrusters, especially the end of that workout. So what I'm doing with just the way that I look at it, I'm trying to actually kind of chunk the workout and figure out what I think I can complete in 12 minutes and use that as a, a more realistic target. So right. for me, my, my goal when I looked at this is, can I get one or two thrusters at 135 within 12 minutes? That's going to be my goal. Can I get to that point? And I think everyone should try to do that same thing. Figure out where your sticking point is and can mm -hmm. you reach a target within that workout to kind of shoot for it within the 12 minutes? Right. I, think yeah, that's I, I, I was going to say, I, I love that strategy and that's, that's the way that I think people should look at every single workout and, and also use it as an opportunity to say, this is where I think I can get, um, but use that for motivation as well. You know, I think I can get here so then therefore, let me try to get one or two extra reps beyond that was something that's very difficult for me. Like you said, Dave, the 135 pound thrusters, I wish I could get to that point. I don't think I'll get anywhere near past the, the muscle ups. I just don't have the, the stamina for the bar muscle ups. I don't practice them enough. My technique is not great on them as many times as Dave uh, has tried to teach me them. They're not there now. New, now. Now, Newman, you've done a much better job of teaching me double under, so I'm good there. But, you know, for me, I think, you know, my goal is to probably try to get to those bar muscle ups and get a rep or two there or get there with enough time to be able to rest and get maybe three or four. But I, I like that strategy, Dave. Can, can I mention one other thing about the structure of this workout that I actually really like that they put the most challenging gymnastics component not at the end? Normally the gymnastics right. component, that's the most challenging, the muscle up. They always put last because it's always the one that people have the biggest efficiency in. So it's always like do everything else that we know you can do and leave the hard gymnastics stuff at the end for those athletes that are capable of handling it. Mm -hmm. For me as a gymnast, someone that actually finds gymnastics stuff relatively manageable, I love that they left it more towards the middle or not at the end so that it creates a barrier for those people that are deficient in gymnastics mm -hmm. to be able to actually move to that last set of thrusters. So for me, this is actually a win for technical gymnastics. Mm -hmm. It's something that we haven't normally seen in these, these longer type workouts. I think the workout is genius. I mean, the way in which it's written, it's brilliant. Uh, the fact that it's, it's escalating in, in weight on the thruster is going to be a surprise for a lot of people mm -hmm. that they're gonna find that their entire spectrum of muscle fibers is tapped in that middle round. And so even if you make it to that last round, the muscles are going to be fatigued and begin to fail. And at the highest level, it's going to be very difficult, very. It's a shoulder workout. And let's face it, the shoulders is a very small muscle group. Yeah. You're going let's to reach yourself, capacity Chris. at some point. Speak for yourself, yourself on the yeah. shoulders being a small muscle group. It's bigger than my thighs. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Your your actual 400 meter time on your hands is faster than on your legs. <laughs> it actually right. is. I tested it. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. No, you're right, Chris. You're right, Chris. Uh, watching the uh, open announcement and seeing the the challenger team. I forgot the name of the challenger team. What gym was that? Hendersonville in Tennessee. Yeah, Hendersonville. And you saw the one athlete on the left who just looked yoked. And he was 
failing on his thrusters at the very end on those yeah. 135 thrusters. He was just dying out. And exactly like Chris said, he just could not, didn't have the thrust from the hips to get the bar up and he didn't have the shoulders anymore to, to lock out. So I think he failed two or three times on that. Um, yeah. Before those reps, so if he yep. still finished you know, in 10 minutes, I mean, he still finished two minutes under time cap, which is impressive you know, comparatively to yeah. what most people are going to do. So again, it's deceiving. Oh, yeah. for, if you saw how challenging it was for him being a beast of an athlete himself, take that in consideration for yourself. Who's probably more in the middle of the pack when you're attacking this workout. But what's interesting about this workout is like Dave, you were mentioning Newman, the, the, the double unders are really in comparison to what you're doing in the other two movements is without a doubt, the easiest piece. It's mm -hmm. interesting that they wrote a workout that double unders is your break. Like, and they did mm -hmm. it where you will look at those double unders and you'll go, thank God I got double unders because right. the other pieces are so challenging. And the thing is, you're only gonna have to step on that gas pedal further. It's not gonna get easy. The only break in this workout is the double unders, which is and, incredible and that they did that. Seconds of rest, you know what I mean? Like right. is it, the 20, 42 double unders is gonna take you 20 seconds if you're even adequate at them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not a crazy amount of rest and you're, you are still blowing up your shoulders from, from one to the next. So it will right. continue. To no, you're, you're, we, nice exercise. We, we ran out and we ran out and timed it really quick. A few of us in our gym here. And yeah, exactly. I mean, just, we try to do a few different paces and, uh, you're right. First, first round, if you go unbroken, you're about 22 seconds, uh, at a medium pace. Um, second round, you're, you're sitting at like eight, 18 seconds. And last round, 16 or so seconds. So, I mean, all told, less than a minute of rest if you if you go unbroken. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, on with that, uh, you know, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Like, just go unbroken and mm -hmm. get your rest and then. I know there's probably not much here, Dave, uh, but on the technical side of jumping rope, is there anything that you think might be helpful? Even how you set up your rope, um, how you lay it down, anything that you would recommend just in terms of prep for the rope so that that becomes something that's uh, more manageable for when you get to the rope and when you actually move on to the thrusters. Yeah, absolutely. So I have, I have a um, couple of thoughts on that. So for me, if you're looking for most efficiency of transitions, and I know your barbell has to be eight feet away from the pull-up bar. I think that was the standard, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I like to always turn my my jump rope to run parallel with the pull-up bar because I just don't like the thought of hitting the, the pull-up bar behind me. So right. I noticed that Annie and, and Annie and um, uh, Lauren, you know, they, they stayed, you know, perpendicular to the pull-up bar, but, you know, they moved far enough away. Um, but so for me, if you want to stay close and tight, it's easy just to drop down, turn 90 degrees, step into your rope, right? And you know, you have no obstacles to, to worry about. Um, so from, I, that's what I would do personally, if your gym, you know, has the spacing to allow for that. Um, you know, the other thing is we're always big on this for transition time. We always set our rope up in a, you could say a smiley face, smiling at you or a horseshoe where your handles are in front of you and the ropes behind you. So the minute you step into that horse center of the horseshoe, you pick up your rope and you jump right into your first rep. So if you've practiced that, then absolutely it's what you should do. If you have not practiced that, then limit your singles that you lead in with. You see mm. some people that they, they're, they're waiting for the right time to start. Pick a number and go. Two singles and then boom, take off, mm. right? Um, what I would say, noted, watching Lauren trip a couple of times, and Lauren's phenomenal. You know, Lauren was, is, lives in San Diego when she's not part of Team Reykjavik. And so we spent a lot of time together and she's a phenomenal jumper. And so I was really surprised to watch her trip a couple of times. And, and what that told me is just like uh, Hinshaw said, the thrusters are really going to take away a lot of your, your, your muscles. Right. And so she just wasn't jumping uh, to get that first rep. So that's a big one for me. When you feel fatigued, first rep, jump high, like get that first rep under, even if you have to tuck your knees a little bit, mm -hmm. clear the rope, get the first rep yeah. under, then go into your nice rebounding double under position. So mm -hmm. just avoid that initial trip um, and just stay tall, right? Keep your body long and stacked and tall so that you're using less, you know, contraction, right? And just really more reflexive bounding. Um, Chris can probably an, speak more to, to the dynamic. I just think that's, a, that's incredible advice. Because one of the things I think back on is, is there was a regional event where 
uh, it was a chipper and halfway through the chipper, they had to do 50 ring dips and they followed it up with wall balls. And mm -hmm. because of the ring dips and the amount of fatigue created in the tri triceps, the athletes were missing the wall ball target they underestimated the amount of fatigue that those ring dips were gonna create. And that wall ball, it felt like 50 pounds to them and they would air ball it. And that's what Dave is saying is that don't underestimate that level of fatigue, jump high because you don't wanna waste it in a misrep there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, well said, that was great advice. Thanks, Love it. So Chad, let's move on to thruster. Uh, Absolutely. It's a movement that we know well within the CrossFit world. Um, finally came mm -hmm. out last workout here. I'm curious if this is a movement that you actually enjoy doing. Uh, we, you know, we heard what you thought about the, uh, the dumbbell snatches, not really maybe your favorite movement. And uh, you end up doing singles with the, the deadlifts from last week. But is this is something that you actually mm -hmm. look forward to. 135, I can't imagine, is uh, that challenging for you. Well, I, I love thrusters. I don't necessarily enjoy a large amount of reps of them like anyone else. But as far as Chris Hinshaw is concerned, I can do a 400 pound thruster. He said that many times <laughs> at, at the last camp. And uh, I, true. again, I appreciate the, yeah, he still stands yep. by that. Yeah, it's true. Well, For those listening, it's true. I, I will Dave say, Dave, yep, it's true. I will say that I was doing thrusters <laughs> before thrusters were thrusters in my weightlifting program on my light uh, squat days. I used to do like three or four sets of three with like 120 kilos. And that was, that's 264 pounds. So once upon a time, I Ooh. could thruster a decent amount of weight for reps, but it was not 400 pounds. That was a good uh, clean and jerk for me. But uh, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of things that people do in thrusters that will suck their energy so quickly. And we're specifically talking about being paired with pull-ups and double unders that are going to tax your arms and your shoulders a lot. Now, of course, if you're doing them correctly, they're going to tax them less but what can we do in the thruster to limit your arm and your shoulder use as much as possible? The more you can let your body support the load in the front rack position as you're going down and up, and the less you can use your arms as it's going overhead, meaning that you're throwing with your body um, as you're standing out of the squat, the better off you're going to be and the more effective, the more efficient that you're going to be. Now, within all of these reps that you're going to be doing, of course, you can't do singles. I mean, yes, in the deadlift, I was able to say, don't worry about doing singles or, or, or use singles as a way to make yourself more efficient to conserve energy. You can stand up and you can drop it. If you, if you throw the weight overhead and you drop it on every single rep, it's going to use way more energy because you're going to have to clean it again. Right? So you need to think about the fact that you're going to have to at minimum do big chunks. Now that means that you don't have to go unbroken every time, but if you can, great. If you can't try to do, you know, no more than three sets is what I would recommend, uh, but try to come up with a game plan that allows you to do the large amount of chunk of chunks as possible there. So you can get through them. You don't have to waste extra energy cleaning it back up on, on every single rep within the actual movement. This is kind of an obvious cue, um, but keep your elbows up. And what I mean by that is focus on keeping your elbows up, feel your elbows staying up as you're going down and as you're coming back up and going all the way through the thruster. Because if your elbows are dropping at any point, say on the way down and or on the way up, it's gonna throw your body forward. It's gonna make, make it less efficient, less effective. It's gonna tax your arms and your shoulders more for your elbows to be dropped down any more than you're capable of. Also, when you're throwing the, the weight overhead, if you focus on keeping your elbows okay. up, for as long as possible, that's going to allow you to throw more with your body for a longer period of time. Again, if your elbows drop in the middle of your stand, you're going to transition into using your arms to push the weight overhead uh, more quickly than we're going to want you to, then, then that's going to be optimal. Within keeping your elbows up and within going down and up and, and throwing overhead, I like to tell athletes and what I 100% do with myself is I relax my hands and my grips and my grip as much as I can. So for me, what that means is that I will, when I come back down after a rep, I will allow the bar to roll all the way into my fingertips. Now I'm not letting my fingers come off the bar, but I'm taking it out of my grip. I'm taking away the chance that I'm going to death grip the bar, which is going to suck my shoulders and my arm energy away. So I'm going to let it roll to the fingertips 
I'm going to front squat in my fingertips. I'm going to stand with my fingertips. I'm even going to throw it over my head out of my fingertips. But then at the end, of course, let it roll, roll to my palm by the time it gets overhead. For me, that's easy to do because I jerked out of my fingertips for all these years. But I think it's something that you can get down pretty quickly. If you'll do some practice reps um, and get into a, a, a rhythm with it, I think it's something that people can do pretty effectively and pretty efficiently pretty quickly, especially if you have mobility limitations anyway, it's going to save you so much energy. Um, and in the end, a, a lot of time. Now, if you have really good uh, overall front rack mobility and you don't feel like you need to do that, at least put some thought into and some feeling on relaxing your grip. If you have really good mobility and you're still death gripping the bar, that's still the same. It's still going to be an energy sucker for you. Okay. Now, another thing that you can do to help save your arms and your shoulders is follow through at the top of the thruster, meaning extend up onto your toes. Now, if you get tired, if you get enough weight on the bar um, or you get fatigued enough, it's just like uh, wall balls that you were talking about uh, earlier, Chris. What I see athletes do all the time is they'll start their wall balls and keep their feet flat on the floor. The more fatigued they get, the more they start coming up onto their toes. They get even more fatigued. What do they do? They start jumping the weight up because they have to. So what I'm saying is that if they had to do that at some point in the workout, that means that it's something that's probably more efficient. So if you'll start that at the beginning, beginning of the workout, at the beginning of Karen, you might conserve a little bit of energy and ultimately get a little bit of a better score. It's the same thing with thrusters. If you're keeping your feet flat on the floor through the, through the whole thruster, through the throwing over the top of your head, you're using less of your whole body. You're using more of your upper body, using more arms. Um, when you shoot a basketball, you follow through by flicking the wrist and even extending up onto your toes or jumping off the ground. So it's the same thing, same kind of thing here with CrossFit. We talk about movements that we want you to use core to extremity with when you're not extending up onto your toes on a thruster, you're cutting some of that extremity out. So you're, you're not performing that equation to the best of your ability, right? So uh, that's probably all I have on thrusters. Bro, that's a lot Can of I, stuff. Uh, yeah. Some great, yeah. great points. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, I have a question. So for me that what, what is makes thrusters so difficult is even at 95 pounds, I can't breathe through the movement. I can't, I have to brace and hold mm -hmm. my breath, which sends my fatigue soaring. And, and yeah. from what I hear from you, are you saying for someone like me, where the weight, the load is heavy, should I not drop that bar? And should I take my break by holding onto the barbell and catch my breath and then go again? Or, or should I do when it gets to that middle round, drop it and recover and do singles? That's a great question, Chris. And I think ultimately, if you have to do singles, then of course do singles. One of the things that I think can help hold you off from that and other athletes off from that if th those thrusters are heavy or if you feel like you have to brace. And, and I think you set me up for this because I think you know what I'm going to say. Rest with the bar over the top of your head, right? Yeah, so you, you, my question you, All right. <laughs> you complete the thruster. And so for me, those weights aren't heavy. But if I get tired, when I need an extra breath, my rest is going to happen with the bar overhead. Some, a lot of that is because I have good overhead positioning and overhead mobility, and I can truly relax and breathe in that position. Um, but with the amount of weight that we have on the bar here, even if these are fairly heavy for you, they should still be manageable enough that you can hold it overhead for a few extra seconds, breathe, and then rebrace again. When you rebrace, bring it back down and go right into that squat. Um, don't, don't catch it and stop in the front rack for any amount of time. Make sure that you're rested and ready to go with the bar overhead. Love it. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I love that too. And that was going to be my question just because <clears throat> whenever I'm resting in a thruster, I always do it overhead, but it's, I'm like, it's my handstand is so good mm -hmm. that it's a very comfortable for minute, for, uh, position for me. I actually am resting. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, and also if I then use that momentum from the top of that hole down into the next rep, it acts almost like right. a slingshot. If yep. I have to hold it in a front rack position, I feel like I kill that momentum from the top part and I break it into sections. And I don't feel like I can even breathe as well when I'm in a front rack position, let right. alone use the momentum from the downswing of the, the thruster to kind of help propel on the way up. So I'm yep. glad to hear that you, um, you're a proponent of that as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And again, you, you don't want to stop in the front rack position in this, in the standing position. You want to go through it as you're talking about, yeah. but that goes back to me saying, learn to release your grip because when you bring the bar down and you're going into that squat, if you have a death grip, and especially if you have uh, limited mobility in your front rack and overhead, uh, and you're holding onto that death grip and those elbows are dropping as you're coming down to that, it's never even going to get completely into your front rack position so you can take the pressure off your arms at all. So rest overhead as you lower, roll it to your fingertips or relax your grip and go down into your squat from there. Love that. Uh, Chris, did you want to yeah. say something else there? No, no, no. I, because I agree with you. I think that resting in that rack position, it almost feels like under that, that, that load for me, it's like, I'm, I'm holding 150 pound D ball. I can't breathe at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really good advice. Well, the other, the other thing that you point out there, Chris, um, Chad, that I think is really important, especially as you go from thruster back to bar is what you're talking about with your grip. And I think this is such right. an important key for some of the comments that I wanted to make on the bar muscle up and the, and the, uh, the pull-ups as well as the chest to bar is it's a few things. One, just, just building off what you talked about with grip and this idea of releasing and regrasping. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about you having a really good appreciation for how that works because you've done it for so long, but that people can actually implement it fa fairly quickly. Yep. I'm, I'm, that was kind of a main question for me because it seems more complex than you're making it out to be. Um, but it's something that I highly recommend with any of the pull work, especially as you start to transition from a pull to a push, as the last movement will happen with your bar muscle up, mm -hmm. it's going to require you to release the bar a little bit, turn yeah. over and then regrasp. So the idea being that you don't constantly fatigue your forearm throughout that entire time on the bar. Mm -hmm. So the idea is the same as what you're talking about. But for me, it's something that actually, I think requires a little bit more understanding of what the bar is doing in your hand. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it's something you think people can actually gather and get a hold of relatively quickly. The reason why I think that for uh, thrusters is because most athletes are too probably too relaxed in their in all of their front squats, right? So because they're used to doing all of their front squats that way, they're going to be able to pick that up and apply it. So what's going on is that we have two conflicting actions that they're doing that I want the opposite with. They are too relaxed in their front squats and they're too tense in um, forcing their grip and muscled with their thrusters, right? So if they can kind of meet in the middle with those, that's what we're looking for. But because they're used to both actions, they're going to have a better chance to be able to apply, apply that pretty quickly in the, uh, in the thruster, as long as they're not letting all of their fingers roll out. Of course, if, if their pinky rolls out or you know, any amount of their fingers roll out from underneath the bar, they're not going to be able to, to do the next thruster very well. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's such a great, uh, a great thought as you get back onto the bar and just a quick couple of tips from my end. And I'm curious to hear your guys thoughts on this as well, but, uh, the bar work, the gymnastics component, uh, the first boo. part, boo, come on now, give me a little bit of love. Um, the, the first thing that I noticed is that, you know, every athlete that we saw during the open announcement did butterfly pull-ups and butterfly chest to bar. Now, what I will say is that if you have a good, compact, efficient kipping action, you can stay just about as fast. So if you're looking for it uh, from, from purely a speed perspective, you can be just as fast if your kip is efficient and, and compact as you would be doing a butterfly. And I think it's a safer movement for your joints over time. So don't look at the butterfly being done by the games athletes and think that I have to mimic what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing it with a kipping action, chin over bar, chest to bar. Both of those are going to be kipping actions. And I think it lends itself to be a little bit more effective for the bar muscle up because it's actually more of a similar action than what you're seeing with the butterfly. Mm -hmm. So that is number one. I wouldn't recommend the butterfly if it's something that you're not accustomed to. A compact kip can be just as fast if you know what's going on with it in terms of efficiency. Two, where you're talking about with uh, releasing of the bar. Now, again, this is going to come into play a little bit more when you actually go through that transition from pull to push. So the bar muscle up is where you're going to see this mostly come into play, but you will want to be releasing the bar to help transition over. So if your wrists are weak, and this is just a general comment with bar muscle ups in general, if your wrists are weak, it becomes a big issue with trying to get your shoulder on top of the bar where people's wrists fall behind. So instead of the shoulder coming on top of the bar in conjunction with the wrist rolling over, the shoulder comes over, but the wrist stays behind the bar and they have no leverage point to push down from. So a lot of athletes that maybe have enough weight on top of the bar, but no leverage point because their wrists are weak or wrists have not turned over, they get stuck. 
that's when we start to see a lot of chicken wing action happening where one shoulder is getting thrown over the bar and then the other, they can take the rotation of the wrist out of the equation by just throwing half of their body on top of the bar mm -hmm. and then catching themselves and pushing out of it. So I would take an extra consideration of trying to make sure you're releasing a little bit, turning the wrists over as you're actually getting mm -hmm. the shoulder to come on top of the bar. I think it will save your forearm a little bit and also help with the transition point to get on top. Next part is understanding, again, the bar muscle up component will become more of a push component than it will a pull component. You know, you think of pull-ups, chest to bar, bar muscle up as heavily dominated by being a pull related movement. But if your pull is weak, it turns into a push movement, meaning you're going to finish your dips really low at the top of the bar. And you're going to finish and you're going to have to press out a full mm -hmm. dip repetition of every single one, which means that your thrusters are going to suffer for it and vice versa. So my recommendation is to think about the pull and the timing and think more of a lat activated pull rather than extremity related pull on your bar muscle so you can finish higher and not have to do a full dip rep on top of that bar each repetition. The person that did this really well, I would highly recommend everyone go back and watch this workout again. But if you watch Tola do this bar muscle ups, it was a thing of beauty. Uh, for a dude his size to do gymnastics movements as well as he did, is beautiful to watch. They were incredible. He was finishing almost fully locked out on every single repetition. And I think that's what allowed him to catch Khan at the end of that workout is that he was able to conserve some energy for his thrusters so that when he got back to that heavier, heavier barbell, Khan had to put it down and Tola had the, the ability to finish through. I think he conserved some energy because his bar muscle ups were more efficient at that end point. So try to use a little bit more lat activation when you're pull, be patient on your pull. Allow your toes and knees to rise in the front part of that swing and be patient before you react. Bar muscle ups, pull ups, and, and chest to bar as well is about patience and reacting at the right time. I always tell people it's basically like a cobra striking. You have to be very, very patient, but when it's time to react, boom, you have to react at 100%. Most people will end up pulling a little bit too early and miss the timing, which means that they will end up catching low. So if you can actually be patient on that swing and allow it to rise and react at the right time, it will allow you to finish higher up on the bars. So for me, a good bar muscle up will lead to a more efficient thruster in that heavy barbell and save your triceps a little bit. Jesus, you guys are yeah. smart. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> it's so, so, so hard to do. It's so hard to be patient with muscle ups for me. I'm going to have to go get some practice in before I do this workout. But Dave, I did have some questions on what you talked about, kipping pull-ups versus butterfly pull-ups. And certainly agree, you know, again, we look at the elite CrossFitters and, for example, with deadlifts, they're able to go touch and go all the way through or somebody like Jordan, who's elite as well is able to do, you know, uh, go unbroken on, on the deadlifts. But it's, it's a similar kind of recommendation that you're making when I say don't be afraid to do singles on the deadlifts. Don't be afraid to just kip instead of having to force yourself to do butterfly that maybe you're not as good at right now or it's kind of an unnecessary thing for you to, to uh, think that it's something that you have to do. Now, taking that a little bit further, is there a point for any athlete where you would say that doing literally singles on the pull-ups or the chest bar would be better than trying to chunk them together? Because for me, with where I'm at with pull-ups, honestly, it's probably quicker for me in the, in the end to, to do singles pretty quickly there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I see. I see no reason. In fact, most people's biggest trouble is linking the first rep to the second, second rep on a majority of these movements that re rely on kipping or butterfly action. So if you're not incredibly efficient on understanding how to link, you're gonna create a ton of inefficiency from rep one to two. So if that's a problem for you and you know that maybe you have the strength to work through it but you don't have the efficiency of the swing, do singles. I, I think that's, that's a great strategy if you're someone that actually has trouble with that linking component of going from one to two. We normally see this most as a problem with toes to bar, where the mm -hmm. second rep becomes a huge problem in terms of linking. But the same thing can be true for chest to bar, uh, you know, chin over the bar pull up, or even a butterfly type of an action. So if that is trouble for you linking, I would absolutely go with um, singles. And you'll probably see a lot of people do this, especially as they get towards that yeah. round of chest to bars. For sure. Hey, Dave, what are your, what are your thoughts on, uh, on chin up grip for chest to bars? Does that make it easier to pull in? Is it allowed? Your chest to the bar if somebody struggles. So oh, from, I, from I a standard perspective, to... I don't I don't know from a standard perspective if it's allowed. Yeah, I don't but either. <clears throat> what I will say is that in supinated grip, if you're hanging supinated grip, it's going to be 
even more apparent as to whether or not you have a soft tissue mobility issue. Mm. So yeah. it's going to probably expose any mobility that you have in terms of range with your kip or your butterfly action. So while it might allow you to actually pull more, it's probably going to fatigue you more quickly because it's going to rely on a more compact swing and more strength. What you're looking for is a combination of string, uh, strength and swing whenever you're using kipping action. Take advantage of the kip as much as possible, but it's going to be limited unless you're someone that has great mobility and underarm soft tissue. It's most likely going to require more strength, even though you can probably do a, a stronger pull in supinated grip. I think it'll be less effective in the long run. Okay, good, good stuff. Appreciate it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to know if that's uh, if that's allowed. I'm not sure that it has ever been allowed before that I that I know of. But uh, hey, if I can use that for a little bit of a break, I'll I'll take it. Chris, I, I'm wondering from you, you know, and and obviously there's no running in this workout or anything else, but you're a a genius when it comes to strategy. For you, if you're working with someone, you know, like Matt Frazier or someone very close to that level, what would your coaching advice be for them? strategy wise and how would that differ from someone that's more of an quote unquote average crossfitter i believe the key in this workout is knowing when you're in control and when you're out of control and so one of the things that i just i wanted to share with listeners was what we call talk test your ability to communicate while working hard and we use this talk test to to really help an athlete judge their level of intensity when they're in control. And when you are in control in this workout, but on the borderline of going out of control, there is what we call the ability of saying two sentences, such as this workout is hard, but I'm good to go. If you can say that without interruption from demand of oxygen, meaning your breath in for more oxygen interrupts that two sentences, then you're no longer in control of your breathing. And if that occurs before 10 minutes, you are in trouble. Now, if you actually resort to only being able to say two words, such as I'm in trouble, three words, you are in trouble. Or oh you shit. You should only, yeah, you should, you <laughs> should feel, feel that with about 40 to 45 seconds to go. If you are only able to say two words inside of 10 minutes, you are in serious jeopardy. And so part is what I want the listeners to realize is that if you could say two sentences, you're borderline. But if you struggle with that two sentences by getting interrupted for a breath, then be careful because death is on its way. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing, Chris, because I <laughs> literally any CrossFit workout for me immediately... <laughs> One word, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, that's it. Shit, you're now, down I, I, I mean, awesome. I can't even say why the hell am I doing this? There's no way I could say that sentence right there. <laughs> so, well, so that's where part part of it is, is that, you know, we, we, we do this talk test and, and, and easy paces where you can communicate like this. And, and that's easy. Uh, lactate threshold, your maximum sustainable pace is two sentences and two words. That's your finishing kick. Nice. So, nope. so you're, so you're at, so you're uh, telling the the listeners out there to think about what that is for you. Maybe even test it out a little bit with a portion of the workout and stop somewhere in the middle and see what your ability to speak is. Part of it is it's it's about awareness and and unfortunately with CrossFit. CrossFit athletes do is they go out hot and they blow right through their maximum sustainable pace. And the next thing you know, they're hinged over with their hands on their knees. And that's not how to maximize performance. So it's about awareness that as you're progressing through, can you actually say two sentences? And if you actually get interrupted for the demand of oxygen and you're, in, you're still not even past 10 minutes, you're in jeopardy of hinging and putting your hands on your knees mm -hmm. and stop it. And so part is, is you never as an athlete want to give up control of the workout, meaning you want to decide. You don't want the body to shut down and decide for you. You never want to pass the baton to death. Right. That, I think that quote right there. Oh, I there you go. See, I but like that all it. goes hand in hand. 
that all goes hand in hand with finding the most efficient ways to move. You know, again, if that singles for you, if that allows you to maintain a more consistent pace and to be able to speak in the way that Chris is talking about, then that's probably what you should do. On the other hand, if you do three unbroken pull-ups and you come off the bar and you have to lean over and, you know, gasp for however long, then maybe that's going to be less effective for you. But what you're doing is, is that you are intentionally slowing down after those three and getting back into control. So when I used to do the sport of triathlons, I called it the edge of the envelope. What you would do is you would intentionally put yourself into a deficit. You would be hyperventilating. And then what you would do is back off. And what you do is you ride that edge of the envelope for this entire workout. Mm -hmm. But do not think for any moment that you can remain at a two word you know, sentence and, and survive 12 minutes. This is not a two minute workout. You can't go out hot and hope you hang on. You're gonna die. <laughs> I will die. Yeah. It's a hard workout. Yeah. And, it, and if you're not afraid of this thing, there's something wrong. <laughs> I was looking at uh, some of the pacing here that I thought was uh, interesting. I was watching Khan's um, performance since he was the first uh, guy to the bar uh, from the, the Reykjavik team. His, his first round, he completed in one minute and 31 seconds. So 91 seconds, he did the whole first round. Wow. The second round, he finished in 92 seconds. So he basically was able to complete the entire second round with increased weight, increased difficulty of the movement, and basically the same amount of time. And so from a pacing perspective, and obviously it, it went to two, 228 for the third round. So it kind of caught up to him a little bit there, but he ended up finishing at 531. That's incredible. Is from your perspective, would the goal be more to try to keep things consistent from round to round or to try to get the first couple of rounds out as fast as you can, since the movements are a little bit simple, the, uh, simplified, the weights a little bit less and then reserve a little bit more time for the more complex movements and the, and the heavier weight? So in my opinion, it depends on your physiology. And if you're a fast twitch dominant athlete like Chad, who has a much higher percentage of fast twitch fibers, Chad has more latitude in this workout. Same with Con Porter. I mean, he has a lot more latitude where for myself, I'm gonna tap and drain my fast twitch fibers in the first round. I will be in trouble because I just don't have the percentage of those fast twitch fibers to rely on. It would be the same thing if Chad went out for a light jog with me. He doesn't have the slow twitch fibers to be able to endure for long durations. He's eventually gonna walk and he's gonna walk in a short amount of time. So it's about awareness. If you're a speed strength power dominant athlete, then you could take more risk in this workout. But endurance athletes, athletes, that have amazing recovery. They have an incredible ability to endure, but they're not strong. Be ready in that first round to be in trouble. If you're not aware of that in advance, you're gonna find yourself finishing that first round and wondering whether or not you could actually start the second. That's why for me, it's very intimidating because 15% mm -hmm. of my muscle fibers are fast twitch and I will use those up in that first round of thrusters. There mm -hmm. won't be any more energy. People need to understand it takes three minutes of doing nothing to allow those fast twitch fibers to recover. So unless you're planning on sitting on the floor for three minutes, <laughs> it's, yeah. that's why I, I look at it and it's, it, this is a scary workout for me because it's so much power output. Now let, let's get into some predictions for yourselves. Uh, Dave, let's start for you. Uh, Chris, before you jumped on, um, Dave gave us his uh, breakdown of how he did 22-1 and 22-2, and he, he crushed it. He kicked ass, especially last week, uh, got into the round of sixes. Right. So he's clearly the right. most fit out of our group. Uh, but we didn't hear your score right. on 22-2, Chris. How'd you do with that one? 62. 62 reps. Did you do it RX? 185. Uh, yeah, for me, I'm not yeah, doing yeah. what you're doing anymore. I learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you, should, you should have redone the first workout, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not doing that either. No, this one. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll give my prediction. I mean, I, I, I got to think about it. I don't know if I can get through the second round here. I, All right, well, I, this, Dave, workout, this scares me. Yeah. Dave, we'll start with you with uh, predictions. Uh, where do you think you'll be able to get through on this workout? Um, you know what? Uh, I, 
this will be interesting. I think something we kind of didn't get into too much in this discussion, though, but um, but it's in in my mind a lot is is just um, plan breaks. You know what I mean? Like kind of mm-hmm. picking picking numbers and even like trying to do that before I feel fatigued because I know just like Chris and all of you really concur that it's going to catch up pretty fast uh, at the movements that especially that you're you're not as efficient on. So. Um, I mean, those thrusters will get heavy for me, um, and uh, and the the bar work will get increasingly hard for me as well. You know, chest to bars. I wish I were. I don't, I don't have that shoulder flexibility and that that uh, soft tissue that you were mentioning, uh, underarm soft tissue. Um, so I know those movements are going to tax me as well. So for me, I'm really going to think about it in terms of like picking my numbers and and doing um, very methodical chunks. Right. Mm-hmm. But with without a lot of without a lot of break, you know, that's that's kind of the goal. I mean, the, the, like we talked about, the double unders are a joke. So those, those will be, you know, a very easy, just smooth, uh, get through them rest period. But um, one thing I forgot to add, and we were saying it's a very short breather on your double unders. But don't forget to breathe. A lot of people mm-hmm. like to hold their breath for whatever reason. Breathe, because mm-hmm. when you get to the thrusters, you're going to be sapped if you're not breathing. But um. So, you know what, I'm, I'm hoping uh, if I have a good day, I'm hoping I can get to the 135 thrusters and try and be chunking through that. And really, it's going to come down to how well I do on the chest of bars and the bar muscle ups. If I can mm-hmm. be methodical and get through those, um, then I, you know, hopefully I'll get toward the tail end. Finishing this workout, I don't, I don't know if I have the driver desire to like really <laughs> hope to do that, but... Who knows? Well, for those of you out there that don't know Dave, Dave is incredibly fit. So I wouldn't be surprised if you actually did finish the workout and uh, and beat all of us as you did last week. But um, would you say that the bar work is going to be the, the hardest bar for you? Oh, even I mean, yeah, the, uh, the, the pull work, not not the bar, but not the thrusters, more the gymnastics component. The, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the thrusters won't be too bad. I can I can manage the thrusters and I can keep keep those sets, you know, manageable and keep moving. Uh, it, absolutely. The chest of bars and the bar muscle ups, uh, without a doubt, will be my, you know, the biggest struggle for me. Um, so, yeah, so it's just, you know, being methodical, trying to remember, I should have been taking notes of everything you guys just said. I'm going to have to come back and watch this again. <laughs> I'll be doing it. I'll be doing it first thing in the morning. So, right, that's Friday morning, 5.30 a.m. We just get out there and just knock it out. So uh, I'll text Love you we'll guys when I'm in. done. Yeah, we'll check back Absolutely. in and see how it goes. Chad, what about you? Yeah, like I said before, I, I think um, I should be able to make it to the the bar muscle ups, and and at that point, it's kind of a toss up if I'm going to be able to grab even one rep. I mean, when I get fatigued, bar muscle ups are extremely uh, difficult for me. So you know, my game plan can be one of two things: I can get there as quickly as possible and rest for a little while, you know, maybe even a minute or two to to try to get a couple bar muscle ups in, or I can just be much more conservative in, in my pace getting to that point and try to be a little bit more fresh. So I don't know, maybe I'll do this one twice as well, just to, to experiment a little bit more. All right. How about sure. yourself, Dave? <clears throat> uh, myself, uh, I think I mentioned it a little bit uh, in the beginning, but uh, my hope is that I'm able to get a couple of reps of 135, maybe one right. or two. And uh, I think, I think that's realistic for me to get to that barbell. I probably will end up doing singles or maybe rest in that overhead position and get one or two, mm-hmm. but um, I think that would be basically as far as I'll be able to go with that workout. Nice. I think I'm going to win. I think I'll win then. So <laughs> I saved this. I, 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 I wanted to hear your predictions. So <laughs> I'm 58. I don't know if you've seen what mm. my age group gets to do in this workout, but mm-hmm. I think I'm going to win. But let's hear it. What is it? So it's jumping chin over bar and then it's chin over bar pull-ups and then it's chest to bar. The thruster weight 65, 85, 105. Mm, nice. I think I'm going to beat you guys. You, you might. Be, yeah. 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 I, you know what? I, I want to do so that too. workout. I want to do that workout. I, I think so too. <laughs> I might do those weights. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Is there a modification yet for 40 year olds? Where's that modification at? <laughs> no, nope, you're still a kid. You're a kid. <laughs> Dumping uh, chin over the bar. Boy, I love that move. Yeah, that's amazing. That's well, awesome. since we have him on here, awesome. Gordon, do you have a projection for your, uh, prediction for yourself? Me? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I predict I will not do the workout. Mm. No, that's well. that's not I'm not going back to camp if that happens. Jordan, at least at least read the rules this time, all right? Yeah. So it's legit. <laughs> so with with regards to that, in terms of starting position, I think just so everyone is aware, I think um, the Reykjavik teams are going to have invalid scores because they started incorrectly. They started underneath the bar rather than the eight foot back behind the line. Mm. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're doing the workout, make sure you're starting correctly so that you don't have any issues with start points. So, so, so what is it now, Dave, when you're about to head into the beginning of the workout, which pull-ups are first, right? Yeah. Pull-ups you first. You have to start eight feet away from it. Yeah. Facing the okay. bar, eight feet okay. away behind the line. And then you have to go up to the bar and do the, they started directly into the bar and just jumped, jumped to the bar. So just in terms of setup uh, or what's uh, required, just kind of keep those things on your mind. So I have one question, uh, Dave and Chad, is this a gymnastic workout or is it a weightlifter workout? Mm. Well, I was hoping for Palma Horse, to be honest with you, when mm. they posted that, that old timey <laughs> photo. I mean, I was really gung ho for some kind of Chinese pole or trapeze or something, but um, I think this is straight up a CrossFit workout. I think this mm -hmm. is middle of the pack. This is testing out a variety of different modalities. And uh, the thing that I'm most happy about, like I mentioned that the fact that they didn't put the most challenging gymnastics movement last, which has always been the case yeah. leading up to this point. So for me, that's a cool change. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly yeah. a little bit of both, but for that reason, I think it's more of a gymnastics workout. One, you have the double unders that kind of weigh it in that favor a little bit more as well. But also being that the you know very high skill level and difficult gymnastic movement of bar muscle ups is in there before you can get to that last thruster level. And like Dave said, it's usually the other way around. And for that reason, I'm thankful and I'm glad to see that. But for myself, I mean, of course, I wish that the thrusters were there uh, before the bar muscle ups because then I would have a chance to beat Dave. But yeah, I think it's more of gymnastics. Well, and this is also a hey. long time domain for you, Chad. I mean, it's it, a as long you, time. As you indicated earlier in your description, I don't, and I don't appreciate you, uh, you know, saying those things about me, but no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you know, it's just like running. I'm going to want to walk pretty quickly. And with this workout as well, I'm going to want to pace yeah. very quickly. So yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Hey, here's, here's my hope because in, in all the discussions earlier about, um, when, when Chad was saying rest with the barbell overhead, which I think is brilliant. I, I totally agree with that. Um, but it got me thinking that I hope Chad and Dave tie hmm. and we need, we need to have a tiebreaker at power monkey camp. Hmm. And here's what I thought of for the tiebreaker. We figure out a percentage of your body weight. So whether you do 75% or maybe your full body weight on a barbell, each of you facing each other, Full lockout. Who can hold it the mm. longest? Oh wow! Ooh, Ooh. Ooh. right. Ooh. Interesting. Right? Ooh. Yeah. Oh, wow. right? Well, Dave, we might need hand, to... Dave, the handstand king. Yeah. And then our our two time Olympian uh, yep. Oli here uh, with a four hundred pound clean and jerk. <laughs> that would be exciting. We might have to hold that for Thursday night challenge night. It can't. Yeah. We have to do that anyway. That's good. We we might need to do that anyway. But I'll tell you right now, there's no chance I'm tying with Dave on this one. I mean, I couldn't even tie with him on the deadlift workout. So come on. <laughs> You got I'm, a pretty gonna, good lockout position, Chad. I don't know. I, you I got do. a good lockout. I'm going to have to start practicing that because I know Dave's doing long handstand holds all the time. So That's true. That's true. It's one thing in my in my favor here. Uh, last thing, any athletes that stand out to you for uh, epic performances like we saw? I, I know we, uh, we mentioned Tia last week and she tore it up, but it's not so much of like a, uh, you know, groundbreaking thing to pick Tia to win a workout. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, right. it's just unbelievable. But um Anybody that stands out that is not Mal O'Brien either, who clearly know, is right? just built for wow. this workout too. I mean, wow. Yeah. She, to me, she's like completely built for this. Her gymnastics mm -hmm. is amazing. Her thrusters are going to be super fast. Like anybody else stands out? Mm. I mean, to be honest, I'm, I am just, I have to go back to Mal. I'm just looking forward to seeing what score she puts up on this. I mean, I'm just mm -hmm. that, and that's all I can really think about. Do you think that Mal O'Brien scares Tia scares me. I mean, <laughs> she, yeah. seems, she seems like I, I would be, I would be a little concerned. I would too. Yeah, as so young. Old, yep. Training yep. With, with Matt every day, getting a little bit of his tidbits and uh, right. you know, Matt was training with Tia for the last few years. So he has a little bit of insight mm -hmm. into how she trains and maybe mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with, with, you know, 
her training regimen and areas where she might be able to have a little bit of a, an edge on her. I, which I love because the women's side has been, you know, without, let's face it, she hasn't had much competition. Yeah. And it will make it exciting. And mm -hmm. especially someone that young. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I really, I, I find that the sport, that will be great for our sport. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. I yep. love watching yeah, her. she's a stud. She is a stud. And she's Super just getting stud. better. She just rapidly getting better. Right. Right. right her trajectory. Yeah. Right. She's rising. And is Tia rising at that rate? Mm. Well, it's, it's hard to stay on top for that long, too. You know, just from a mental standpoint, you know, you need that push to when, when you're the underdog, you have a little extra motivation and knock that top dog off the off the podium. And right. you know, that's why um, she went into bobsled. I mean, yeah. we saw yeah. that she's bored. Well, yeah. yeah. Maybe that wasn't the time to go into bobsled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree uh, with you. I think it's very hard to stay on top like that. And she's young and her trajectory is just rocketing. Yep. Yeah, she is nowhere near done improving. Not even yeah, I, Which is going to be great for the sport. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, there's a I few love others it. Too. There's a few others, you know, there's uh, Emma mm -hmm. and... Uh, you know, Emma uh, Carey, yeah. Emma Carey and Emma Lawson coming up at 17. Now there, yeah. there's a yep. few 17 and 18 year old superstars that are going to be chipping at Mal's uh, heels as well. So the next generation are going to be putting a lot of uh, a lot of targets on some of those superstars backs, those podium winners over the last few years. I, I, I do have a, ch I, so I, this came up in a conversation recently and, and it, in weightlifting, are, are female weightlifters typically young? So swimmers are typically young like on the women's side, yeah. 15 years old, you could be a multi-world champion at 15. Yeah, no, not necessarily. It, it seems like no. weightlifting takes a little bit more um, maturity to, I mean, just because the snatch, for example, is just so technical, right? So it takes time to really perfect that and, and get really comfortable enough to lift as much weight as you can. But of course, there's those phenoms out there that, that are at 15, 16, or 17, um, you know, either winning world championships or, or close to it. But for the most part, it's usually peaking at uh, mid twenties to early thirties. So. so Mal's got a long way then mm -hmm. maybe more than likely. Yeah. And some of that depends on when you start too. I mean, you know, typically mm -hmm. uh, in weightlifting, I see a lot of athletes that start at a really young age, they burn out pretty quickly. So it'll be interesting to see these athletes that are starting at a really young age in CrossFit, are they going to last longer, for example, than a weightlifter typically does? Uh, or, you know, where's that going to fall? But I mean, we're seeing, you know, now a generation of kids coming up that have been CrossFitting from a young age from the explosion of, of CrossFit through the last 10 years yeah. or whatever, you know, longer than 10 Interesting. years. Interesting. That's yeah. cool. But we do, we do have, like we've talked about before, we do have many elite weightlifters uh, from the U S specifically that are competing on the international stage, winning Olympic medals and world medals that came from CrossFit. So it's just, it's all interesting. It's all amazing. It's cool. Well, well, I think we can, uh, I think we can probably wrap this up guys. Uh, it's been fun to do this over the last few weeks. Uh, Dave, I really appreciate the time jumping in with us today. I know, uh, you're hoping for something a little bit more aggressive with double unders, but hmm. maybe we can uh, try and convince them to put a heavy rope in there for next year. Hey, just happy to come to the party, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we'll check back in and we'll let everybody know how everyone finished up after 22-3 after uh, we each give it a try. And uh, we'll let all the listeners out there know how we finish up. But, Chris, you weren't on it initially, but the uh, the poll came back and the loser – will have to sing a karaoke song at camp at the party on Friday night. So that who, who picks the song, the two losers. Am I right? So the winner whoever doesn't winner win picks a song. The winner picks a oh. song. I, I uh, do, we, let's make it a duet. A duet. Okay. <laughs> How about Ebony and Ivory? How about that? It's and, classic. Well, well, we also just picked the theme for the party and it's eighties movies mm, characters. We gotta, we gotta so, do an 80s song then. So it might have to be along that same theme it might all work together there perfect in character beautiful. ready to show up okay beautiful all right fair enough i'm on i'll do it chris sure. i'm i'm looking forward to our duet maybe we should get together <laughs> and practice between now and then not over yet it's not over yet. yet i can't wait well i love all it all right guys no, it, this has been a treat you guys you guys are, yep. are are really like at the top of your game you're really smart and every time we end these calls i just can't believe like we get to do this together. It really cool. 
to, to, to be able to listen to you and learn. Every time I hear you say something like, Chad, you were tonight incredible, like what well, you were I, talking about. Well, and I it's appreciate amazing. That. Yeah, really good. And same with you, Dave. Really good. I got well, you, Chris. Thank you. And I appreciate you saying that about me before you said that about Dave and, you know, making up for the, uh, the, the non-running comments, but, uh, yeah, Chris, same, same to you and, and Newman, Thanks. of course, always an yep. absolute pleasure. Look forward to Incredible. seeing you guys very soon at camp only what less than two months away. So we'll, we'll yep, be, be there all together very quickly yeah. to our yep. listeners out there. As always, guys, we very much appreciate you listening in. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed not only the show today, but, the ones previous and, and the ones that will be coming up. Be sure to head over to powermonkeyfitness.com for services and upcoming events. Also check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, at Dave Durante, and at Ollie Chad, as well as Hinshaw 363 in aerobic capacity for Mr. Chris Hinshaw, and also at Dave David RX Newman or RX Smart Gear for Mr. Newman there. Uh, on behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durante. And until next time, guys, thank you all for listening.